Hey everybody, my name is Eric Manning and you're watching Sunday School Apologetics and today we are asking the question, what does the Jewish historian Josephus teach us about Jesus and does Josephus contain some Christian forgeries? Before we get into the meat of the matter, we should probably talk about who is this Josephus guy in the first place. Well, he was born into an aristocratic Jewish family and lived between the years 37 to 100 AD. Josephus was actively involved in the political and military affairs of the Jews in Palestine and was even a general of the Jewish troops in the Jewish war fighting against Rome in the northern part of Palestine. He ended up getting captured and he defected to the Roman side. He even predicted that the emperor Vespasian would become emperor. At that time, he was the guy who fought against the Jews and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple. And he is regarded as the single most important historian for events in first century Palestine. Now, he's written The Jewish War, Antiquities of the Jews, The Life of Josephus, and Against Appian. These are books that I'm just mentioning to show you that the dude wrote a lot. He was a prolific writer, and you get a whole lot of Bible background information. And for that reason, I highly recommend that you get his works, and I will link it in the description down below. He mentions biblical figures that we're familiar with, like Pontius Pilate, the Emperor Tiberius, the family of Herod, the crazy family of Herod, and Josephus lets us know a lot of those details, as well as Claudius, Felix, and Festus. We know of them from Acts. Uh, John the Baptist, we even hear about how he was murdered, and James the brother of Jesus. We read about his martyrdom there, although that is in dispute, and we'll get into that in just a moment. Now, what is the main thing that Josephus allegedly said about Jesus? This was Antiquities of the Jews, 1863 through 64. Now, there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works, a teacher of such men as received the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ. And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those who loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again on the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these and ten thousand other wonderful things concerning him, and the tribe of Christians so named from him are not extinct to this day. Well, you should probably be feeling a little bit of cognitive dissonance right now, Josephus was a Jew, and he remained a Jew, and obviously a Jewish author would never say that Jesus was more than a man, or that he was definitely the Messiah, or that he rose from the dead in the fulfillment of scriptures. That's something Christians might say, but that doesn't make a whole lot of sense for Josephus to say. Well, here's Dr. Bart Ehrman, and I know that Ehrman and I have our disagreements, as you've seen from other videos. But Ehrman did write a book on the existence of Jesus because there's this growing popularity in Jesus mythicism or this idea that Jesus never existed. And so Bart, uh, being as honest of a scholar as he can be, wrote a book against this view. And in it, he says that the majority of scholars of early Judaism and experts on Josephus think that one or more Christian scribes touched up the passage a bit. Speaking of touch-ups, this is the famous Echo Homo painting that Cecilia Jimenez was hired to fix. As you can see, the middle painting needed some work. It had become very weathered, and she turned Jesus into Jesus the monkey, and it was the subject of many a meme. And just because there is a doctored painting that doesn't look much at all like the original, doesn't mean that there wasn't ever an original. So, what did Josephus likely really say? This is John Meyer, his version of what Josephus probably said. And there even is an Arabic manuscript by uh, that was discovered by a guy by the name of Shlomo Pines that says similar things. And it's I'll just go ahead and read it. It says, At this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good. And he was known to be virtuous, and many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified and to die, and those who became his disciples did not abandon their loyalty to him. They reported, that's much more modest, that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. Accordingly, they believed, again, much more modest, 
that he was the Messiah concerning whom the prophets have recounted wonders. So this is what Bart and a lot of other scholars who have studied this subject think that the original passage looked like before it was doctored, unfortunately, by a Christian scribe. Well, Earl Doherty says, no, that's it's completely made up. Earl Do Doherty also believes that Jesus never existed, which is definitely a fringe view. But his argument against this passage, or at least one argument, is that the final thought of the previous paragraph flows naturally into the words of the one following, whereas the opening of the latter paragraph doesn't fit as a follow-up to the closing sentence of the testimonium. In other words, it just doesn't flow. Well, against this view, here's Bart Ehrman again, and he says that it wasn't all that uncommon for ancient writers who never used footnotes to digress from their main points. And in fact, other digressions can be found in the surrounding context of this passage. So this argument doesn't really amount to much, and Doherty actually admits this to an extent himself. Now, what's the second most popular argument against this being uh, not a complete forgery? But, or I should say that it is a complete forgery. What's the, what's the second most popular argument? Well, it's that no Christian father mentions this passage until the 4th century, which is Eusebius, pictured here. We didn't have early Christian apologists like Justin Martyr, Tertullian, or Origen making use of this passage. What's up with that? And Origen even mentions Josephus, but he actually never mentions this section. Isn't that a little bit weird? Well, here again is Ehrman, and he says that a pared-down version contains very little that could have been used by early Christian writers to defend Jesus and his followers from attacks by pagan infidels. It's a very neutral statement. The fact that Jesus is said to have been wise or done great deeds wouldn't go very far in the repertoire of the Christian apologists. And when you think about it, Celsus and others were writing that, you know, Jesus' mother was basically uh, a loose woman who had an affair with a Roman soldier and Jesus had an ugly temper. This just wouldn't have really gone very far. And so it does make sense why they wouldn't use it. And Greg Boyd here says that Jerome who was writing around the same time as Eusebius, he knew about the testimonium because he mentions it explicitly, yet he never makes use of it. In fact, he never makes mention of it again. He cites Josephus over 99 times in his writings. Had Jerome not mentioned the testimonium this once, critics would have counted him among the number of those whose silence supposedly proves the testimonium didn't exist. And so this argument just really isn't a very good one. It's just an argument from silence. So what's argument three? Well, here's Doherty again. He says, in the case of every other would-be Messiah or popular leader opposed to or executed by the Romans, Josephus has nothing but evil things to say. And this is true. Josephus says a lot of nasty things about some of these would-be Messiahs who were trying to deceive the nation and fight a war against Rome and do a lot of dumb stuff. But in the original passage, there isn't a word about Jesus being a political leader, which Josephus has negative things to say about. Jesus wasn't trying to rebel against Rome. He's mentioned as a teacher who's accused on unknown charges and is killed by crucifixion. There's just not a lot of harsh things to really say about him. He mentions that he's crucified, so he indicates that he doesn't think that he was all that successful and probably was seen as a nuisance. Well, from reading the Gospels, we know Jesus did preach the kingdom of God, but he wasn't a political messiah. He was peaceful. And so there's just no mention, no reason for Josephus to poo-poo him like he was some of these other would-be messiahs. So strike three, they're out as far as the testimonium. What about the second message, or mention, I should say, of Jesus in Josephus? Go ahead and read it. But this younger Ananus, who, as we were told already, took the high priesthood, was a bold man in his temper and very insolent. He assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, the so-called Christ, whose name was James and some others. When he formed an accusation against them as breakers of the law, he delivered them over to be stoned. So we hear about Jesus' brother and his martyrdom. Well, here's Craig Evans, and in favor of this text being genuine, he says that it's a very neutral text. It contains nothing Christian, nothing really positive in the reference to James or Jesus. The whole point just seems to be ex 
to explain why Ananus was seen as such a bad guy and deposed as high priest. But why would Josephus call him the so-called Christ? Someone might say, well, that's pretty positive, isn't it? And it could be confusing. But I don't think that it really is. Here again is Greg Boyd. He says that the very fact that Josephus says the so-called Christ rather than Jesus the Christ suggests that we are dealing with a historian who merely wanted to identify James by specifying his well-known brother, a brother who had followers who believed he was the Christ rather than a Christian interpolator. Well, the name James and the names Jesus were very popular names in first century Palestine, and there are 20 other Jesuses that Josephus mentions, and so it does make a lot of sense for him to add some sort of disambiguation in the passage. Here is another argument in favor for the genuineness of the passage on James. There's origin. He wouldn't have mentioned this passage unless he was sure that his pagan readership would have uh, found the passage in antiquities. In Contra Celsum, Origen, writing against the pagan critic Celsus, cites this very passage. Well, he wouldn't have been able to do that if his critics could easily have called his bluff, went down to whatever library, <laughs> and pulled it out. Now, I understand the libraries weren't the same as they were then, but they did exist, and they could have called him easily out on the shenanigans and moved on. Now, there's also the martyrdom of James. Josephus just says he was stoned to death prior to the Jewish war breaking out, which was 62 AD. Now, Eusebius, Hegesippus, and Clement of Alexandria says that he was thrown down from the temple battlement by scribes and Pharisees, and then they stoned him after he hit the ground, and then a priest came in and stopped, and then somebody came out, a laundryman, and clubbed him to death prior to the siege of Jerusalem. So what's up with these discrepancies? Well, if this was an interpolation, you would think that the interpolator would be a little bit more familiar with the Christian version of James's martyrdom and touched it up. Instead, we just get a very terse, right straight to the point explanation of how James was killed. And so what do these passages tell us about the historical Jesus? Well, we learn that it does corroborate with the Gospels that he was condemned to be crucified by Pilate because of Jewish accusations brought against him. We learn, a corroboration with the Gospels again, that Jesus had a big following, and he continued to have followers after his death, possibly due to their belief that he did miraculous deeds. We also learn that he had a brother by the name of James, which we know about in uh, reading Paul's writings as well as Acts, and also in the Gospels. And even though Christianity had been going on for several decades, there were family members involved in the Christian movement. And their belief, at least in James' case, seemingly led to his death. Well, what would cause you to go down to your death and say that your brother is the Christ and the son of the living God? Well, we also know from 1 Corinthians 15 in that famous creed that Paul quotes that James had an appearance of the resurrected Jesus. So that would explain quite a bit. And so there's also the fact that all four Gospels and Paul attest to the belief that Jesus was David's descendant. Now I find this to be very interesting because 1 Corinthians 9.5 also notes that the brothers of Jesus were vagabond evangelists. And if people were inventing new beliefs about their family origin, it would have been really difficult to do this while they were still around. And Paul, which we know from Galatians had met James, says in Romans that Jesus was a descendant from David. And so it would be easy for James to go, hey, Paul, no, we're, we're not descendants of David. And here's Peter J. Williams, and this is referring to the virgin birth that was later allegedly a development from Luke and the writer of Matthew. But the problem with saying that that was a legendary development that was added much later by these Christian writers is supposing that those novel beliefs arose later, here's Williams, by then Christianity had spread so far and so fast that it would have been difficult to introduce these new innovations. For a start, anyone wanting to spread a new doctrine would have to travel widely to advance that belief, and they'd have to overcome a lot of resistance 
to displace this established belief. And so it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense for this stories to have been cooked up later when Jesus's family had already spread beliefs and people already knew about his origins from them. And so we learn a lot actually about early Christianity and Jesus from Josephus and the critics complaints against Josephus just aren't really as strong as some make them out to be. So I hope you found this video helpful. Again, if you have it in your heart feel free to support me on patreon any little bit helps also thank you for those who are supporting me and some new donors that were added this week i greatly appreciate it also you can visit my website is jesusalive.com for more apologetics particularly historical apologetics and definitely feel free to like and subscribe and share thank you